do we have our Q&A now, I guess? Dr. Anthony is going to answer all the questions. That, that was really great, Rich. I, I met Rich Wall uh, <clears throat> quite a few years ago, about maybe 20 or so, when he led the charge from Uni University of Michigan with a drug called uh, I-131 tocitumumab. Anybody can say that real quick, I'll be impressed. Otherwise known as Bexar. So Rich was uh, one of the founding, I would say, uh, clinicians, investigators in the use of radio immunotherapy, and now we're moving it into the era of radiopeptide therapy. You can kind of say, what's the difference between a peptide and a protein? Well, it's the size of the molecule. So Richard's gotten more, has gotten simpler as he's aged. The molecules have gotten a little bit smaller, but better. So. We'll have to. Uh, unlike me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've gotten yeah. larger. Yeah. It's, and less yeah. 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 Okay, so we've got some really great questions here. Um, we've got the panel. Uh, in the NetSpot label footnote of uh, 33 diagnostically positive patients, one radiologist got only two correct. The other radiologist got 29 correct. Has this training uh, seen better? Is it better addressed? Has the training since been better addressed? <clears throat> Rich? Huh. Maybe, I'd or, love you to answer yeah. that. On, yeah. on the line of training, we have residents that come through, and actually there's a fellowship in, in, in nuclear medicine that is, I think, important to use to get a better understanding of these new imaging modalities that we have. Within radiology, just like every other field in medicine, we have almost subspecialized ourselves to pieces, and as we're looking more at these functional imaging studies, which I think are gonna be very, very important, I'm hoping the people that are reading these functional imaging studies are also gonna be the people that are gonna be involved in therapy. So, yeah, there may be an issue with training. You know, if you have a resident read a report, it should be overread by a faculty that's trained in these studies. It should be a board certified physician doing this. And it'll be important to kind of have someone look at the comparison imaging as well. It's super important not just to look at one modality, just a nuclear medicine study, but look at ultrasounds, look at CTs, look at MRIs, look at the nuclear medicine stuff, look at surgical reports. You know, figure out where disease was and then look to see if it's still there on the imaging that you're looking at. Rich? You know, one, one thing I'd say is interestingly, uh, the, the two biggest radiology training programs in the U.S. are where I am director of Mellencroft Institute and, and at Indiana University. So we, we actually are training a lot of people and I think that uh, at least in training the next generation of radiologists, they are now seeing these uh, cases at specialized centers. Um, I, I think the point made about specialized centers of excellence, particularly with newer technology, it's, it's a good idea to go to some place that's doing these quite a lot. I think I would, if I were going to have surgery, I'd want to go to somebody who's done more than a few whipples, <laughs> you know, if I had to have that. So I think, I think for these infrequent tumors, going to places that have higher volumes is probably, if you can do it, is in your best interest. But we, we have a... Uh, a significant responsibility to continue to, to train people in, in these technologies. I think the good thing about the gallium 68 is since the uptake of the tracer on average is 60 times higher than normal tissues and they show up as bright spots, it gets easier to, uh, to diagnose things. And the problem is sometimes we're starting to see normal structures, tiny normal structures like ganglions and uh, the, the celiac ganglia and the, the stellate ganglia and some normal structures that we have to make sure people recognize as not disease. So um, I think as the scans get better, we're probably going to do better as radiologists. Uh, so if our tools are better, there's perhaps less uh, subjectivity. Okay, the next question is focused again on PRT. Systemic therapy in the U.S. has relied on sandostatin LAR and chemo drugs for the last 10 years. With PRT available, do you think PRT can become a first-line treatment option for NETS? I'd, I'd like to just start off that a little bit. Um, if for that to happen, you'd have to probably do a clinical trial. Yeah. Uh, it may be uh, something that AAA or now Novartis uh, is planning. Uh, I, I really love the fact that people are embracing radiation, I guess in some respect. You want it sooner. Most people won't, won't, don't want radiation, they want it last. So I'm impressed that this audience wants to be radiated sooner, at least one person <laughs> out of the audience. Uh, but do keep in mind that PRT is not 
curative. Okay, Rich, take it. Um, well, I would point out that the radiation that's being delivered is predominantly selective to tumors, so if you're given a choice between radiating your tumor or normal tissue, I'd have it radiate my tumor, which is what this does, a lot of it. So I, since you mentioned I-131 tacitumumab, one of the things we did once we showed it was efficacious in patients who had failed standard chemotherapy or lymphomas, we moved it to upfront therapy and, and, and did a, like a 75, 80 patient trial as primary therapy in a, in, as part of a clinical trial. But I was just writing down as we were sitting here, like this needs to be moved up to primary therapy, but only, it would only be done in the trial basis. Um, but I think it's, it, if it keeps working well, it will, doing it earlier, is important, but how we stage it, I, th I think the risk, since one of the things is since, uh, you know, unfortunately, this, uh, you know, if you're 65 to 70, the radiation sensitivity of somebody at that age uh, is less than if you're 15. So um, the, the, the downstream risks of even the off-target radiation are less. So I, I think it's a fair way to think of it, but it has to be done with trials and maybe with a Novartis, as you say, as a sponsor, it would be possible to actually move this stuff earlier. And the other aspect is <clears throat> secondary malignancies, MDS, mild dysplastic syndrome. Um, I've yep. done enough PRT. I've seen it. It happens. It seems to be in the female less than 50 that gets it. And we're, some of these people are going to go to have been through the Cape Tim, the, the Cape side of being Timzolomide. Timzolomide is an alkylator. So for people who've had pancreatic primaries, there's no data to date on radiation in the setting of alkyl prior heavy alkylator therapy. So this, the safety is not there yet uh, on, on multiple of these subtypes. You have to remember that when trials are done, they are very, very selective on who they take. They try to get a homogeneous group. When the drug is out there in the real world, now we're looking at a heterogeneous group. So we've got to really be smart in using PRT because we don't want it to go away. We want to make PRT better. We don't want to harm it, so, but it's not for everybody. And I think it really needs to be selected by a group that knows the technology, that knows the disease. Any, any other comments about that? Okay, so the next question is pre, pre, uh, pl briefly explain carcinoid crisis issues, right heart problems, is the damage due to cancer or high levels of serotonin? And what is another reason to keep serotonin levels low? Um, so carcinoid crisis is that occurs at the time of a procedure. Mary, you want to take that? Um, uh, sure. Um, carcinoid crisis can be actually super duper scary in the OR. So w when you're talking about the timing of, of intervention in someone that has bulky disease in the liver, we will often actually choose to treat the liver up front in order to decrease the likelihood of having a carcinoid uh, crisis at the time of more aggressive intervention. Now there are protocols um, out there and so we follow a really strict protocol of preemptive octreotide in the operating room. We try to keep it from happening. It's most important <coughs> to keep it from happening than to try to, to um, treat it once it's already started. But that I think David can probably um, uh, talk about this too because the same things can happen in the IR suite which is a slightly less uh, monitor uh, yeah. setting, but I think the same principles apply, yeah. is that you have to have a, a really well-established protocol, you have to have an anesthesiologist that understands it, and the goal is to pre prevent it from happening as opposed to treating it once it's happened. Yeah. A absolutely. Pre prevention is the key. So a carcinoid crisis or a, a sudden release of hormone will crank up your blood pressure. You know, you, if, you, if you have symptoms of neuroendocrine syndrome and have flushing and diarrhea, those can be magnified extensively. But the crisis is really blood pressure. And if you don't control that, strokes, uh, heart attacks, whatever you're going to have are going to happen. So you try to decrease the risk. So what Mary and I are doing is pre-treating people with something that blocks the release with uh, a somatostatin given subcutaneously or IV. The bioavailability is about the same. So for my procedures, whether it's a biopsy, which can stimulate the release of a hormone, an ablation, uh, or an embolization, where I suddenly cause something to be deprived of arterial blood flow, the, whatever I'm taking that blood flow away from is gonna get angry at me. It's, just, it's gonna release that hormone. It may not be right on my table. It might be during the night, the next day. I don't know when it's gonna be. So oftentimes people have arrangements with emergency rooms to get infusions, not just taking the subcutaneous injections at home, 
but if they come in, they have kind of a contract plan with their local emergency room saying, hey, I've got these symptoms. It should be a knee-jerk reaction that you come in and get this drip without a lot of you know, waiting around. So carcinoid crisis is real. Uh, anything that can disturb the amount of tumor that you have can release the hormone, and you want to try to stay ahead of it. So what, what this question also is the acute, <clears throat> what we've talked about here is the acute carcinoid crisis. This question also concerns carcinoid cardiac issues. So in, in this regards, the right heart failure, tricuspid insufficiency, uh, uh, <clears throat> pulmonic artery, uh, pulmonic valve stenosis is related to chronic serotonin exposure. So we have acute, that's life-threatening potentially, and then chronic, that's also life-threatening, but, but could result in, in uh, artificial valve surgery. Uh, so that would be a reason to keep the serotonin levels low. And by doing the interventions here with PRT potentially, with surgical <coughs> debulking, we would, again, with telotrostat, be working with octreotide to keep those serotonin levels low. How often do G1s and G2s change to G3 during the course of treatment? Uh, it's uncommon. Uh, what we see with the histology, we can, on the initial side, we want to make sure that it's not a heterogeneous tumor, that it's not G1, G2 to combined. We get semblances of that uh, with the scanning, and we also get the, we get the further understanding with further scans over time. So we let the biology declare itself. We can't necessarily see it all up front. Ideally, we would be able to get an FDG PET scan at the same time as a gallium scan, and then we would see potentially G1 and G2. Insurance in the U.S. doesn't cover FDG PET for G1, G2 neuroendocrine tumors. Sometimes we can sneak them in and we get it. Uh, usually it's a miscoding, but if we really wanted to understand the biology up front, the imaging would be the, the best way of doing that. Our pathologist is limited at what's under the scope. and, and that is limited at how good the biopsy needle rep did a, uh, represented the overall tumor picture. So uh, in oncology, uh, we know that uh, when you have a tumor and you, know, and you look at it from space and then you get down and look at it from, from uh, just a couple of inches, uh, we could f clearly be missing something uh, and not have a true representation just with a single needle biopsy. And so that's an understanding of the disease from the front end. Uh, where are the nine indications for gallium 68 net spot published? Um, I can, uh, it's in the, if you just search uh, the Journal of Nuclear Medicine appropriate use criteria, if you go to Google Scholar, um, I could, uh, that's where you'd find it. It's, but it's in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine in the last several months. It may only be in the online version. Um, but, but that's, that's where it was published. And, it, and this is not just nuclear medicine people writing what they thought because they, they think it's great for everything, but, um, but it, it had representatives from a variety of societies and expertise in uh, surgical and uh, medical oncology. Next question is, how do you manage bone mats in your patients when they are small and asymptomatic? Uh, <clears throat> this is really a kind of a complex issue. It falls more on the medical side. Um, one is surveillance. The managing here sometimes is surveillance. Uh, using octreotide would be systemic therapy. Uh, the <coughs> questions that come up is do we do uh, denosumab? Do we use these osteoclast inhibiting agents, uh, the bisphosphonates, zoledronic acid? Uh, so we're, data that came in from Berlin, uh, this last ASCO, actually suggested that we that the biology is a little bit different in neuroendocrine tumors than carcinomas in the bone. So we have to be very careful in doing it. So I think the really right answer for that eventually would be PRT, because I think PRT would, would treat bone metastases. So if they're advancing or symptomatic, we probably will go with PRT. If they're asymptomatic, we may, desert, we may uh, decide to do something a little less uh, interventional. Uh, and it all is, again, patient-driven, very dependent. Uh, on on uh, the the individual case, it's hard to make a single answer that applies to everybody. Does syndrome cause low sugar reactions? I get shakes, sweating, and lightheaded feelings every, even after taking octreotide shots. Anybody want? I'm happy to take that unless you all want to. Uh, all yours. <laughs> so do what? Okay. So so what happens? Uh, octreotide can cause hypoglycemia. It's more likely to cause hyperglycemia. 
But in any, again, in any individual situation, the, the, the yin-yang aspect of glucagon and insulin can be uh, impacted with the somatostatin analogs. We saw this early on in, in, in octreotide development. So the syndrome usually probably does not, but it's the octreotide that probably does. Um, so in, in that case, you know, following the blood sugars afterwards and working with your primary care doctor or your medical oncologist to manage that would be the recommended approach. What are the clinical motivation behind the Novartis purchase of AAA? Uh, I'll take that one initially and pass it to you guys. Uh, why big pharma does anything is based on growth of their franchise. Uh, Novartis uh, is the Goliath in neuroendocrine tumors. It started with Sandoz, and when Sandoz and Siva merged in about 1996 and took on the name Novartis, which means new art, uh, that became uh, even a bigger behemoth to support the structure and the, of uh, this rare disease. So now you have Ipsen, uh, basically a European company that has Lanreotide and now has a relationship with with uh, lexicon and promoting uh, the telotrostat drug. Uh, but the, the thing is, is that Novartis brings a lot to the table. They had the Octreothere franchise that didn't pan out. Um, and I think with bigger pharma getting a successful product like this puts them in competition with uh, Ipsen. Ipsen also is developing PRT. So you really kind of want these companies to go at it because that's what capitalism's all about. That, Rick, you want to say? I, th I think you summarized well. Okay. Uh, next question, what are the correct tests to monitor carcinoid? I only get chromogranin A and lactate dehydrogenase now. I used to get pancreas statin and serotonin levels. No one, um, it's hard to individualize and say, this is what every patient needs. So the approach is on the front end, you can, you can get a shotgun of what markers are elevated and then go forward with what seems to be the most uh, productive markers going uh, forward. The, the sad aspect about these markers are uh, they're not sensitive to um, decision making. So they can be elevated, but we look <coughs> back at other things and we don't necessarily make clinical decisions based on one marker jumping up. Uh, and the other frustrating part is that when we know someone's at risk for recurrence, we don't have a marker that's real sensitive for that. By the time the serotonin levels are up or any of these markers are up, there's usually widespread metastatic disease. You all want to say anything about that? Yeah, if we find something that's elevated at time of diagnosis, we will use that to follow, but I totally agree with not relying and making decisions upon those numbers. You have to put it into perspective with respect to imaging, how a person's doing, how a person feels, what therapy is ongoing. Only, uh, this person only have CT scans every six months. How can I get gallium 68 or dotatate scan? Well, the answer to that is go to a center that has the scan offering, and I think you've got uh, St. Louis, you've got Indianapolis, you certainly have Lexington, Kentucky, and other centers will be added on more as the PRT program develops. How does carcinoid affect the thyroid? Just diagnosed with Graves' disease and have a 1.8 centimeter nodule in the thyroid pathology benign. So the only way it really impacts it is uh, octreotide itself can cause, in some people, hypothyroidism, so checking the thyroid function once a year or so is what's recommended. Uh, the Graves' disease is probably, it's an autoimmune disorder. We don't think of uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients at, at necessarily at risk for autoimmune disorders, and we don't look at the therapy itself putting patients at risk for autoimmune disorders. Any thought about that? Mm -hmm. But we know, I've seen the neuroendocrine tumors oh, yes. go to the thyroid, <laughs> but that's just totally separate uh, issue. Uh, ER visits, carcinoid syndrome ER visits. ER docs want to do CT and other scans. When are they necessary? When scans indicate no progression or blockages, is it protocol to just treat the symptoms? That is severe abdominal pain, bloating, flushing, extreme nausea and vomiting. Mary? Um, yeah, I can, I can take that because that actually it is not that uncommon. Is, um, is when we first brought gallium to the clinic, it was under an FDA-approved investigational new device application. And there were three reasons why we would, we would be pursuing a gallium versus uh, conventional imaging. And one of those three was in patients that had symptoms out of proportion to what would be expected based on conventional imaging. 
And when we looked at the first 100 cases that we did, 90% of the time, the gallium 68 ended up answering the question. So, so the, of the three c categories that could even fall in, so 90% of the time we would be able to explain someone's symptoms based on a gallium imaging that were not picked up on conventional imaging. I actually think it's super important in that group because I think there's high likelihood that you have disease that's causing symptoms. The problem is, is that if you are post-surgical, you can have ongoing or progressive symptoms associated with the post-surgical state, malabsorption, some vitamin deficiencies, <clears throat> that will also fuel the same types of, of symptoms. But unless you have an adequate understanding of the current burden or extent of disease, it's gonna be impossible to really know what's going to improve those symptoms. But my prediction is if you're going to the ER for the third time with the same symptoms, that I would use that um, as a reason to get someone a gallium 68 scan on appeal. And now that gallium 68 <coughs> is, is FDA approved, I think it would be much easier for us to, to get that. Very good. So, so the frustrating uh, aspect we see in this is, I'll, is when a, someone shows up in the ER, pain itself becomes an indication for a CT scan. Mm -hmm. So frequently that scan is a different kind of scan. It's a non-contrasted scan because they're looking for kidney stones, looking for other things. So when we get that report back, and usually they, then, then the disposition is returned on college clinic next week, we look at that report and it doesn't help us a lot because it's non-contrasted, yet we've just wasted, in, from our perspective, from a, from a consumer control, we've just wasted some insurance dollars and we can't tell the person that they've progressed or not definitively. Uh, so we, we use that scan, but we can't, use the same, in, we can't use it to as a real uh, progression scan. David. Yeah, the hard part at this point is that the gallium scan is not going to be available on an immediate basis through an emergency room. It may get to that point pretty soon, and the emergency room docs have to try to figure out what's going on with you. And the imaging that's available short-term, 24-7, ultrasound, CT scans, MRIs, with or without contrast. Um, you know, so you kind of have to put things into a clinical common sense area. What can they do to help you? And what they want to do in an emergency room is just exclude badness. They want to make sure you're, you can be discharged safely, that you're safe to go home, and then on an outpatient basis, we can do the definitive testing to figure things out. And unfortunately, you know, we, we just can't solve everything at, immediately at the same time. We'd love to be able to. Um, from an imaging point of view, if you're looking to exclude something like a perforation, an obstruction, uh, as Dr. Anthony said, a non-contrast CT is cheap and easy, um, but it may be symptoms, it's just working out symptoms you've had before. No imaging may be okay as well. You know, if you come in and say, this is what I've had before, do they think it's worse? Do they think it's better? You know, we have to go back to our med school days and say, well, here's common sense, on exam we see this. <coughs> Uh, on blood tests, which are cheap, we see this. Do you need the extra radiation or not? Okay, David, this next one's for you. Why not withdraw the tissue after thermoablation, like in prostate, quote, green laser work? I'm not familiar with the prostate work, but withdraw the tissue? Well, I think with prostate, you've <coughs> actually got a tunnel through the penis that actually you can withdraw tissue from. Okay. You can use it for BPH. So, uh, it's a it. different technology. Yeah, can, well, on the, on the radiology side, we do have some techniques that can remove tissue at the same time as biopsy, and a, a good form of that is mammography. We now have these devices that almost look like a tube that go in, and you have this thing that kind of grabs that tissue and takes out the entire area of calcification in the breast at the same time as it tr diagnoses, it may actually treat. But you still have to figure out the extent of disease. With respect to prostate, uh, folks are going in through a channel. The, uh, the, in the penis is a tube called the urethra, and they have a scope that they put in and they shave off different levels of the prostate gland as they remove that device. So they're physically able to remove something from a channel. When I go in with a biopsy, I can take a sample of tissue out. When I go in with an ablation, I've got the same size needle, perhaps just a little bit bigger. I can't physically remove all the tissue that's there, but I can do something to the tissue that I can reach at the tip of that needle. So we don't quite have the technology yet to put in a very large diameter cylinder that I could use to take out a chunk of tissue in the operating room. That's a little bit, it, it may be possible. You can kind of follow down a needle or a wire that's been positioned at the level of a tumor, and you can follow that little wire and take out a chunk of tissue at the tip of it. I just can't do that percutaneously yet. Okay, Mary, this next one has to do with mid-gut disease. Pros and cons of repeat liver resections years apart. 
Oh, I think there's going to be ample evidence to, to support that. We even have have evidence to support it in a, a disease with a less favorable outcome like metastatic colorectal cancer. So the thing about substance-bearing resections in the liver is it leaves all of those options open to you going forward, and it's going to be the same uh, risk-benefit discussion the second time around as it was uh, the first time around. The, the disease interval between the two resections definitely helps us determine the, the benefit you know, of that. So a long disease interval would actually favor going in and continuing with a very assertive you know, surgical approach. But as long as so the liver is, uh, how I dried it, is it's like a tree, and the brown stuff is the foliage of the tree, and the foliage will regenerate, but the branches will not. So as long as you save enough of your branches to, to support a, a regeneration of the foliage, you can do a heck of a lot of, of liver surgery over the course of a lung disease. So what percent of liver involvement, of tumor involvement in the liver determines transplant option? Oh, well, that's, that's a really loaded question, and I thought that, that, um, that uh, for the, in the context of this, the way that we select patients for, for transplant is, um, is even more selective than how we're, we're doing it for resection. So transplant for neuroendocrine is actually not done on, on any aspect of disease burden per se. It's got to be limited to the organ that's going to be removed. But it doesn't have to do with whether or not you got 50% involved or 100% of that involved. It has to do usually with the consequences of treatment of the disease. So if someone's had liver-directed therapies over a seven, eight, nine-year period of time and is starting to have liver function test abnormalities, and therefore the driver of that patient's mortality is no longer the cancer but the consequences of the treatment of that cancer over a long period of time, that's an indication for, for transplant. So the main uh, target patient populations that we have transplanted to, to date have for the most part had either a single organ dysfunction for us, so that becomes the driver of the mortality, or, or more than one, intestinal failure, need for TPN, multiple bowel obstructions from, from surgery, liver insufficiency, or a combination of, of both of those. And I think that when we look at the risk benefit and ultimate benefit, is that once you're on a road for which you are living <clears throat> with the quantity and quality of life issues of all the treatment that you've had, it's not about hemming and hawing over what the next um, five years of your life is like. I don't think you have to look through a crystal ball and say, oh, it's going to be rosy. No, it's going to be what you've got, if not progressively worse. Those are the ones where we've been most successful in transplant. Very good. How important is it to find the primary tumor? How often should you be scanned? We can now actually take the tissue from the biopsy and submit it to a company called Biotheranostics in San Diego. For neuroendocrine tumors, they're right about 95, 96% of the time. So we can do it with the molecular genetic fingerprint. So we don't necessarily have to do it with imaging. So what we do in the real world is we will uh, get the liver biopsy. Usually that's where, where it is. Could be a lymph node. And we'll get the imaging. We'll get the gallum 68. We'll figure out, because we're going to do that anyway. And so that may end up show us the primary. If for any reason there's been involution of the primary, we can't find it, and we think it's important, we might submit it for this pathological testing. So I think it's important to know the primary because I think there we know the behavior. We can work more in terms of when to order scans and when, what medications might work in the future. So how often should you be scanned? It's a very much of an individual basis, not one uh, answer fits all, but anywhere from every three months to every year in general. Um, we're going to fire. Is uh, PET 68 not easily paid for by insurance? Any question? Any guess when it will come a standard of care where it's paid for by insurance? Mary? I can take that too. So, um, when we first brought Gallium 68, we had to do a peer to peer every single time. We had to, to prove to the insurance company why we were doing it. And I had to do that even though I was telling them that the scan was better and cheaper. So I think it has to do with the rungs that, that are on the payer side of things and the fact that most denials are actually coming from a third party and not actually the payer itself. Then we went to the five top payers in the state of Indiana and we got them to uniformly agree that the Gallium 68 was the superior and the cheaper test. So now I think with the net spot is probably hindering us a little bit because I can't necessarily say it's going to be cheaper because how your organization charges for a test is not, David and I have, you know, we have no control over that. 
And so I think that the reason why I'm getting denials now has more to do with that at net spot. So the FDA approved agent is now available and therefore the charge differential may, may not be the same. We can still get it approved, but that I personally think that it's gonna be people with like more physical and professional stature that we're gonna go to the payers at a much higher level and prove once and for all that there's no reason to do a lower resolution scan that is less likely to give you the answer that, that you need and, and just sort of unfortunately for the Octria scan people, move that to the side and really be looking at the indications for gallium 68 or FDG PET. So it's really interesting that she brings this up because the Aetna that was listed on front just this past week, I had one of the most aggressive conversations I've, yeah. ever, I've ever had in peer to peer. And so the, on the other end, I was hearing, well, we will let a CT scan, an Octria scan be done. I said, look, this patient's already had an Octria CT scan. And by the way, Octria scans no longer are done anymore. That's old, that's ancient history. I don't want that. What? We'll approve an Octria scan. No, I don't want it. And so the next statement was <coughs> like, do you all have any people guiding your organization on changes that's evolving in this area? Just quietness, nothing on the back end, nothing, nothing. So these insurance companies have these, I don't motivations, ulterior motives of restricting care. And when I even sit and say, look, the gallium scan's the same price, or IU, it can be cheaper. They don't want to hear that. But you're saying we got better technology, and I don't want the old technology. It doesn't help me. I need to know, through, I need to know more, I need to know everything I can about this situation. So I'll refuse, I will refuse to do a scan that I, I've lost confidence in telling me all the things I need to know about. Richard, you want to say anything? Well, yeah, the, 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 a lot of the insurance companies have uh, third-party agencies uh, that, that sort of are experts who do these things, but they're basically experts who are paid to deny coverage. Um, I, I mean, exactly. I mean uh, that's, exactly. That's why they do it. I mean, it's unfortunate. Um, but, you know, so, so they don't have a high motivation to take on new things. I would say this, though. Medicare right now, uh, if you have Medicare and a lot of patients are over 65, it covers it. And, and at least in St. Louis, the vast majority, majority of our carriers are covering it in part due to outreach efforts. And the one I mentioned in particular has been a slower adopter. Um, but, but I think it varies by area, but I think the patients have to complain. And uh, it, it's a huge waste of physician time if you want to talk about extra costs where we have to be on call, uh, a phone call for 20 minutes with somebody who actually doesn't know what they're talking about telling you you can't have a scan done. Um, it, no, it's a huge, it's, you know, where you should be taking care of patients. So that, that, it's a big problem. These pre-authorizations, I think, are completely out of control, a huge waste. Um, but as patients, you have to advocate for what you need. And if you don't get what you need, you have to work for, on appeal. And uh, there are a variety of ways. And I would just point out that every state has a state insurance commission. And uh, I've been not denied certain things uh, in my just sort of routine care. And I write to the state insurance commission, and they'll go after the insurance company. And it's amazing that they will respond to those in, uh, commissions. So I, that is an option you have if you're denied. And we have had cases where I have had someone calling me to explain in great depth why they were they had to deny it when we had already gone to the person above them and gotten it approved. And I, not, I don't know the difference between Dr. X and Dr. Dr. Y, because all I care about is whether or not it got approved. And so I said, well, I can stop you there, because Dr. Y already gave me an approval of that. And he's like, oh, that's my boss. I was like, OK, then. <laughs> you know, but that he was all ready to go on his blurb about all the reasons why I had to understand why we were not getting this covered. <clears throat> I do believe that when you start with centers of excellence and then you get people with a lot of professional stature in it and then you connect it with the right level of authority within the organization, this one to me is a no-brainer. You know, there are other times where we may hem and haw. Okay, I'll, I'll right. close with one last comment. As PRT gets approved, I'm going to predict that the gallium <laughs> is going to be easier to order because it's going to be linked. So the minute therapy is ordered, then the gallium is sort of automatic. So we'll have to wait over the next uh, few months and see if that comes true or not. Okay, so you all have done a great job this morning. Uh, you've actually asked more questions than we can possibly get answered during this session. So I think you clearly are engaged in, 
and my hat's off to you. It's been really rewarding for us as speakers uh, to be with an audience that cares as much about it. So we'll break right here because uh, uh, lunch is out, outside in the lobby, and I've noticed very few people have gotten up to leave, and I think that even speaks higher of the motivation of this group. So. <laughs>